So this represents about 10 years of my life at least, if not more. So viewers of previous videos will have seen this hanging on the wall in the background. Normally there. Yeah, normally there. It's been repeatedly falling down over the past week, so I've taken this as a sign that I'm meant to do a video about it because there's actually quite a lot to talk about in this one little patch of sky. This region is about the size of the full moon on the sky. So it's about half a degree by half a degree on the sky. So if I held my thumb up at arm's length, it would pretty much obscure um, the whole thing. So as a fraction of the entire sky, it's really quite tiny. But it represents, at the time that this image was taken, a real technological advancement, which was the development of wide field cameras. So when we take a picture with our telescope, we basically bolt on a camera with a CCD on it, just like the CCD that's in your phone or in the camera that you're using right now. And the bigger the CCD, the more pixels it has, and the larger the image will be, depending on the optics of the telescope it's attached to. When this image was taken, this was using a very new wide field camera. So this had eight large format CCDs stitched together, so uh, 8,000 by 8,000 pixels in one field of view. Times have moved on, technology is, com it is advancing. That's small potatoes compared to the telescopes and the cameras that we're building now. What we did, my collaborators and I, was focus on this one patch of sky and we've been studying it in detail ever since. And so you can see the caption which is in German because my collaborators who are involved in, in building the instrument and taking this image um, are German. But it says, and forgive my pronunciation, Zen thousand galaxies auf einen Blick, which I understand to mean 10,000 galaxies in one glance. And that sums up what this, this, this camera was able to do. It was able to stare at this one patch of sky for many, many nights at a time and reveal the just, just the depth of interesting objects that is, that is to be found in one little patch of the sky. So remember how, how, what a small fraction of the entire celestial sphere this represents. But just look at how much is contained within it. My collaborators chose this patch because it was known to have some interesting large-scale structure in it. So we live in a galaxy called the Milky Way. Our galaxy lives in a local group, but there are larger structures than that in the universe. There are groups, there are clusters of galaxies, and then there are clusters of clusters of galaxies. So the people who chose this target wanted to study a chunk of large-scale structure. And so they looked for a region that was relatively crowded, but could still fit uh, an interesting patch of sky into the field of view of this camera. So let me take you on a tour of all the different things that you can see here. So first of all, you see all the bright patches, these things here. These are stars. These are stars within our own galaxy, meaning they're almost right in front of us. And we have to look through them in order to see out into what we call the extragalactic universe outside our own galaxy, which is where all the other galaxies, all the other objects are in this. Um, so, so in a way, to me, they're kind of the prettiest thing in the picture, but are they a bit of a pain in the backside for you? They're both. They're both essential for what we want to do and annoying. So if they're too bright, you can see something like this, this bright star here. Uh, first of all, you get these crosses, which are diffraction spikes. So this is uh, re resulting from internal reflections within the telescope. Likewise, you've got these rings, which are ghosts, and you've got basically a spillover of light. So Stars are really just point sources of light, but if they're too bright, then they sp basically spill out over the optics of the telescope. And so they, they form these regions where it's very difficult to make proper measurements around them. However, we do need the stars, at least for the kind of science that I did with this image. We need the stars because if you want to very carefully measure the shapes of galaxies, and I've used that to do something called gravitational lensing on this image, you need to know how much the atmosphere, the, the changing air in the atmosphere, is distorting your image. You need to know how much the optics of the telescope is distorting your image in order to figure out the tiny amount that each galaxy has actually been lensed by intervening mass along the line of sight. So to do that, you need something to calibrate with. 
and that's where we use the stars. So we don't use these bright stars because they're, they're too messy, but we, use, we can identify lots of other stars in the image. Because we know they're meant to be single point sources, we can correct the optics of our image in order to make them be point sources. And in doing so, we remove all of those instrumental and atmospheric effects from the galaxies, and we're left with the signal that we're trying to measure. If you look in here, one of these stars is not like the other, and I think you can probably see pretty obviously which one it is. That one's very red. That's it, yeah. Okay, what's going on there? So one of these stars is red, and of course stars are different colors, and that represents their different properties, their different temperatures. It so happens that we have one kind of M dwarf star here, which is a variable star, which happens to be very, very red. And this causes a really serious problem in, in, in subsequent observations because although we started with this image of, of this patch of sky, we've gone and looked at it with every single telescope we can get our hands on since. And we used the Spitzer Space Telescope, which is an infrared telescope, which is sensitive to red wavelengths. And in preparing the observations, we realized if we just took a picture of this field with this red star smack in the middle of it, we'd burn out the telescope. And so we had to do this very complicated sort of tiling of multiple um, uh, shots with the, the Spitzer Space Telescope in order to avoid that star and keep it out of the image. And so yes, these stars can be a real pain. So the thing I'm interested in, if you look closely, you see quite a lot of large yellowish galaxies and they form a structure that you can trace all the way across the image. And this is a piece of large-scale structure that we call, for lack of a better word, the Abel 901-902 multiple cluster system. Very catchy. <laughs> yeah. For lack of a better word. Yeah. Well, we're not going to call it Bob. <laughs> this is the fairly nearby patch of the universe that we're interested in studying. And we've used this in a variety of ways to understand how the properties of galaxies are related to the environment they live in. Because it's a dynamic environment, it's um, something that's still in the process of forming. Galaxies that live there undergo an awful lot of external pummeling from various sources. And we're interested in sort of galaxy ecology, how a galaxy depends on where it lives. So that's that's sort of this, this main bit. But there's still so much more. While this image that I'm showing you here was taken with a ground-based telescope, we've gone back and looked at this with as many telescopes as we can get, at as many wavelengths as we can get, because each wavelength tells us a different piece of the story. Um, but sort of the crowning glory of all that was an 80-orbit mosaic with the Hubble Space Telescope. So just like you might stitch together multiple pictures with your own camera, we took 80 shots with the Hubble Space Telescope and stitched it together. Each image with the Hubble Space Telescope was a rough square about that size. And so we had to do 80 shots with Hubble in a funny pattern to cover the whole thing. Hubble can't, Hubble's not very wide, is it? It's not. It's a pretty small telescope. But the beauty of it is the sharp, sharp images that it got. So while this was a great image by ground-based standards, we were still looking up through this murky, moving atmosphere of air. And to send a telescope above the atmosphere, we got really, really sharp images, which were able to reveal much more about the objects that are within this. Here's some close-ups of some of the interesting things. Where to start? So this little guy right here, when you look with Hubble, with the colors taken from this image, you see this beautiful face-on grand design spiral, which is what we call a flocculent spiral. It's fluffy. And that fluffiness means that it's forming lots and lots of stars. That just happens to be in the foreground. So that's a nearby, relatively nearby galaxy. It doesn't actually have anything to do with the structure that I'm interested in. The structure that I am interested in, this is one close-up of this region right here. So this is the core of this cluster here. And you start to see the variety of galaxies that live in this crowded region and the various shapes that they take on because they're being affected by the environment in which they live. Do you just get super excited the first time you see these images? Oh yeah, I mean these galaxies, these are, I, I will recognize them if you just pop them up uh, in isolation. I know, I, I know where they are, I've got them on my business cards. <laughs> For example, this beautiful collection here, this is in our supercluster, and this is uh, down here, this little collection of, of things here. And you see how the Hubble 
space telescope starts to reveal the detail and the dust and all the messiness of a galaxy galaxy merger. Likewise, this thing is a star forming monster, oh. which is this object right here. So it doesn't actually look like that's something very interesting in this image, but when you look in detail, you see that this is the massive merger of two galaxies. So let's, let's really emphasize the, the three-dimensional nature of this image. So although it f appears flat on the, on the, on the, on the page, we, we know that the stars are nearby, we know that some of these galaxies are a little are further away, but there are galaxies even further away than that, which you can see are these tiny, tiny little numerous tens of thousands of little um, dots which are galaxies in their own right, but in the more distant universe. Um, and so, you know, one of these little cosmic coincidences happened that we're interested in studying a galaxy cluster. So we look at this galaxy cluster here. What do we see behind it but this collection of red galaxies, which is another galaxy cluster even further away. So the red color indicates that they're at higher redshift. They're further back in the more distant universe. So we've got two massive structures along the same line of sight. We've got nearby objects as well. So again, a little, something that looks like a little smudge on this ground-based image, when you look at this in the Hubble Space Telescope, gets resolved into multiple individual stars. This is a baby galaxy. This is a little dwarf spheroidal galaxy. Again, almost next door really nearby to the Milky Way. There's nothing in our solar system, or there's nothing, there's nothing really in the foreground that, I guess that would be a miracle if something, if something swept by close by. In this image, no, there's nothing. Um, there may have been satellites that have been removed in the, in the um, processing. In the Spitzer Space Telescope, we had asteroids passing through that made a very uh, distinctive trail that we, we had to remove. So yeah, I mean, the, the, the skies are a busy place. There's lots out there. Um, some of it moves, some of it doesn't. Occasionally there's, there's a complete surprise that's thrown up. I think it might even be that one. But I, I can't even, you can't, the point is you can't even tell from the ground-based image. But when you looked at it, when we looked at it with the Hubble Space Telescope, we saw this beauty, which is an example of an Einstein ring or a perfect bullseye gravitational lens system where this foreground galaxy within our cluster has gravitational lens bent the light through gravity from a background galaxy sitting directly behind it so that the image of that galaxy makes a perfect ring around our galaxy. Does the square itself have a name? Like is this, is this called, you know, square 38 or the Z square or is it, what's the square, what's the overall patch code? Uh, it doesn't really have a name. The, 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 the ground-based image that this poster came from is one of four fields in the Combo 17 survey, so that's, that's our acronym. and then. When we made the, the mosaic with Hubble Space Telescope, we gave that survey a name, which is called the Stages Survey, the Space Telescope A901902 Galaxy Evolution Survey. Astronomers love their acronyms. The more contrived, the better.